right, everybody. Well, um, came up and did something that my mom always told me not to do, which is to start talking to somebody without introducing myself uh, earlier. Um, my name is Jaime Gonzalez, and if, for those of you guys who don't know me, I am the um, founder and co-president, uh, president and co-founder, along with Loana, of the Coastal Prairie Partnership. And um, I'm very excited that you guys are here today. The partnership was started in 2009. And um, I have three announcements, and then at lunch I'll talk to you a little bit more about the partnership. Um, but basically, uh, one of the things that I wanted to, to mention is the tremendous amount of, of knowledge and interest in prairies that we have here today. Everybody doesn't have their organizational name tags on. I'm not used to seeing some of you folks in regular street clothes, so it's kind of different. But I just want to mention some of the groups that are here so you know the interest uh, that is very, uh, very kind of uh, on, on the move in terms of prairies. So today you have people from the Houston Arboretum, Houston Audubon, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, Texas Parks and Wildlife, Houston Zoo, Harris County Flood Control District, the uh, Nature Conservancy of Texas, uh, the South Texas Prescribed Burn Coalition, various schools in the area, the City of Houston Parks Department, Prairie, the Prairie, uh, Cajun Prairie Society, uh, Texas Master Naturalist, for whom we owed a, a huge debt of gratitude, not just for helping us put this on today, but helping us run our projects, whether it's on the Katy Prairie or Sheldon or whatever. So we had the, uh, if I leave out a chapter, let me know who I'm missing. Gideon Linsecum, Gulf Coast, Coastal Prairie, Galveston Bay. Any other chapters represented today? Yes. Cross Timbers. Cross Timbers. Wow. All right. So that's, if you guys don't know, that is up in... Fort Worth. Fort Worth. Yay. Very good. Um, we also have a subcontractor from NASA. We have a, a duck biologist from Ducks Unlimited, Native Prairies Association of Texas, and actually more. So one of the things that we try to do with the partnership, and the reason the partnership exists is what I tell people is different logos, same team. We're all on the same team. We're all trying to do the same thing. And therefore, we need to lean on each other like I lean on Andy and Jim Willis and half the people in this room for advisement. So what I'm going to do, guys, is I'm going to go ahead and um, ask you to do one thing, uh, logistically speaking, before we break for lunch this afternoon. We are going to honor um, Houston Chronicle columnist Lisa Gray today with our Dick Benoit Upper Texas Coast Prairie Award. Very well deserved. And we'll talk about why she's winning that award. So what I would like to do is go ahead and give her the award at noon before we break for lunch. Break for lunch, meet into our expert teams, and then go out for the restoration. That way she has uh, uh, everybody's attention because she is somebody that is a uh, true friend of the Coastal Prairie community here in Houston, and we're very excited to, to honor her. So if we could just uh, do the, the presentation first and then have lunch, that's great. All right, so I don't want to break in to our next speaker's time, Aaron Shyamalan, because I have a lot to learn from Aaron. So I'm going to try to stay on track. And what I would like somebody to do is tell me when I have, when it is um, five minutes until my time is up. So that's 1030. So this is going to go rather quickly. And that way, um, we'll go ahead and stay on track. So if you have questions about urban prairies, I will be stationed at a table with the urban prairies thing and talking to you. Now, one thing I will say from the very, very beginning is this. This is a very, very different cat than doing a restoration at Sheldon. Different goals, different objectives, different pressures. Um, and so we are using and borrowing some of the techniques and the expertise in this room, but know that there are some different outcomes that are necessary to make it work in the heart of a city like Houston. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk to you about a project uh, we have in the heart of the Texas Medical Center. This is the most expensive prairie land in the whole Coastal Prairie bioregion. I know it because that value, that property is valued at $8 million and it's two acres. So if you got a more expensive piece of property in the Coastal Prairie, just let me know. So this project, if you ever want to see it, just to give you an orientation, if you've ever been to MD Anderson Cancer Center, this is an MD Anderson Cancer Center project along with KPC. It is at the corner of Holcomb and Fannin. We are going to have a uh, Prairies by Rail tour later this month as a part of Prairie Month. Um, so uh, on October, I think the 29th, we're going to actually get on the light rail, drive down to this project, see the restoration, and then drive down, to, uh, take the light rail again to Herman Park to see another restoration in, in uh, Herman Park. So if you have any questions, just look at me, look me up at uh, lunch, or come and uh, talk to me um, you know, at my table wherever I am. All right. 
So, uh, back in, in uh, 2011, I got a call from my father-in-law, and, uh, and he had an interesting proposition. This is the Houston main building, and it was at the corner of Holcomb and Fannin. Right next to it was a concrete parking lot. And, um, and the conversation went like this. Hyman, do you, you want to put a prairie in the middle of the Texas Medical Center? I said, yes, where and when and how? And he said, well, here's the deal. So they contacted, um, uh, so you got to know that my, my father-in-law is one of the chief architects at M MD Anderson. And he said, you know, I got a call. They're going to blow up this building. And the reason they gave me a call was my father was the structural engineer on this building. And they want to know if I want a piece of a girder. And, uh, and, he, and I said, well, what you, do you think? He said, well, I was never a big fan of this. I was waiting for them to blow up this building, but I'll take the girder and I'll help you in any way that I can. Anyway, we, um, we engaged Texas or, uh, MD Anderson Cancer Center, and I will tell you that one of the decision-making points in, in terms of putting prairies into cities is making sure that you're able to spend the time, and you do have to spend the time, to cultivate guardianship. And what I mean by that is you can't plant a prairie in the city and walk away. It will fail and it'll make us all look bad. So it's got a double whammy. So everybody's going to say, oh, those native prairies, ah, they're terrible, they're weed infested, they got rodents, they got snakes. So one key decision point at the very beginning that you have to make is, are you willing to cultivate the guardianship in someone at that site that can then be your champion at that site for you? So we started talking to MD Anderson and we found a guardian named David Renninger. Now, David is the landscape uh, guru there and he takes care of all their landscaping needs. And he'd been looking for more sustainable solutions, but I'll tell you that he didn't know much about prairies. Um, so we had to cultivate that in him. So, this is what happened. We, we did an analysis in terms of what we could bring to the table as far as KPC to decide whether or not we could be present and if we could uh, invest the time. So those are all of our Prairie Builder Parks and School sites around town. We have 21 sites scattered up throughout the Houston area going out uh, onto the Katy Prairie, going from the 5th Ward and, and North Houston all the way out there. And each one of these sites is either growing a prairie or is doing prairie management or growing prairie seeds or something. So as you can see, we have the full-time equivalent, since I don't do education only, of one education person. Um, it's, a, it's a challenge. So we had to decide, yeah, we want to go ahead and do this. And so we decided to do it. The opportunity was too great. So the first step was really getting David educated. Fortunately, at the time, we were in the midst of a very uh, strong drive to save what is called the Lothar Deer Park Prairie. David had a conception that uh, prairies were just this endless sea of grass with no diversity, uh, nothing like that. And we took him out there when it looked like this. So immediately, his interest was piqued. He's got a real love of nature, but he had been in forests his whole life. He grew up in East Texas. So when he saw that the prairie was like this, he started to change his mind and actually went from somebody that had some doubts to really the strongest champion. Now, I will uh, tell you just real quickly uh, about David. He's not a very public person, so I couldn't find very many pictures of him on the internet. There's actually a, from a video, there's a video capture from something he did for MD Anderson. He's actually doing a video there talking about the benefits of the prairie to the MD Anderson community. Now, if you don't know how big MD Anderson is, they have about 17,000 workers there, bigger than a lot of little towns around this area. So it provides us with an in-town entree to a lot of people that might not know about prairies. And David has become such an amazing champion that he's actually going to, with Jim Willis's help, plant out the remainder of nine acres within the medical center back into Prairie this fall. So you don't know where that spark is going to go. So, so, you know, keep working it. And I will tell you, one of the places he planted out, I went there earlier this year, and it used to be just flat lawn that he had to mow 42 times a year, down to one mowing a year. But more than that, there were many, many, many international families looking at wildflowers, butterflies, enjoying them. So one thing, as I say, I say is prairies everywhere, anywhere we can put them, where we can manage them, make them look decent. So guardianship is important. A plan is also important, but this plan is like battle plans, right? They don't survive the first shot. So the, the plans were put together by KG Ashikura and company, 
And we're trying to bring landscape architects kind of up to speed in terms of what plants to plant, what seeds to use, what techniques to use. But it's a learning process, it's a building process, and really like KG Ashikura and, and his company, uh, Ashikura Robinson, is trying to get their heads around uh, all these issues and what to plant. So they came up with a prescription, and the prescription was, let's use Native American seed, uh, two different things, a floral mix, so, so flowers, because it's in the middle of the city, you have to rebalance the balance between grasses and flowers, and let's go ahead and use uh, you know, the coastal prairie mix and some flowers. Now, strictly speaking, Texas Blue Bonnet is not native to Harris County, the, the Lupinus Texensis or Texana, whatever it is. But, cultural bridge, remember, this, the main purpose of this planting is twofold. It is ecological function, but at 1.7 acres, we're not talking about the Katy Prairie or Sheldon Lake. The main goal of this is to build a physical bridge between people disconnected from the prairie and their prairie heartland back to the prairie. So, we have to make some allowances for that, and I'll tell you, tell you how that happened. So, KG and his company gave us this, they gave them the plan, they inspected it and everything, but here's the thing you gotta know, these plans don't come with a maintenance crew. So, someone asked about establishment. We knew going in that that first six to eight months was critical because if we could suppress the invasives for that long and allow the native species to come up, we'd be in much, much better shape. And that's what we did. We hammered the invasives for eight months. And part of that is the soil that they gave us. Because when you blow up a building, like we're about to blow this one up right here. Now, I was not taking this, this uh, film, by the way. Um, here we go. So they, you know, they set the charges, and we got the, we got the uh, invitation to come and see it. Blow up. All right. Anyway, when they blew up this building, um, what happened was we were left with the worst moon soil you have ever seen in your life. They had dug up this stuff from the bottom of the earth. Um, it was to say it was nutrient poor is is calling um, rock fertile. You know, it, it was bad. Okay, and so. They scraped it, and uh, one of the engineers uh, on the project said, you know what, Jaime, Mr. Jaime, we got you great soil. And I said, what, what does that mean? And he said, it's got a compressibility ratio that you can't believe. <laughs> and I said, what the hell does that mean? And he said, you can build any kind of building on top of this that you want. And I said, oh! So, decision point one, okay, after looking at this soil, and Jim Willis can attest to this, is that David made a decision, and I think it was a good decision, to use a microbiological uh, enrichment. So he contracted out with a group called Sustainable Growth Texas. They're located in, I think, San Antonio. And they brewed up a compost tea. And that compost tea was, I believe, very critical to the success of the plants there because it was so bad. The soil was so bad. And we finally got them to mix in one inch of organic material into the top. <laughs> um, but we, there were at least six or seven different applications of this microbiological. Well, one thing that we uh, decided very early on is this. If you're gonna do a project in a highly public space, you need, like I said, you need a guardianship, but you need to provide the technical assistance, and if you can't do it, you need to find somebody who can do it, who can make the connection for people. People are very disconnected. Most people do not know that Houston was a prairie city, that Rosenberg was a prairie city originally. So what we did at KPC, at the Katy Prairie Conservancy, is we designed their signage, and we designed a tour program so that we could bring doctors, care physicians, patients, and other people to the site, because we knew that MD Anderson did not have have that that um, that skill set on their staff and without that bridge the project was likely to fail even if it was an ecological success it would have been a social cultural disaster and people would have demanded to mow it down and I've seen this over and over again where projects have been built people step away nobody understands what they're doing 
thing gets destroyed. And I think we've all seen that. So we decided to take, uh, uh, in terms of our interpretation, two bents. One is, it was what the medical center was. The medical center, except for Bray's Bayou and parts of Harris Gully, which runs through Rice University, was a prairie site. Most people don't know that. Most people don't know that MD Anderson made a lot of his money off of cotton that was grown on Blackland Prairies in the Northwest as well. So there's all kinds of connections if you dig deep. We also, um, you know, David is very much about talking about sustainable uh, sites as well. And it, in terms of water usage, mowing cycles, noise pollution reduction, um, and carbon capture, you know, sites like this are, are great. So this is what the site looked like when we started. And don't let all that darkness uh, fool your eye. That's not rich soil, that's wet. Okay. <laughs> and there were a lot of, there was an, a lot of unevenness in the site. Andy talked about, you know, if you do a prairie restoration in the middle of the country, what you might end up with is pockets of sand and pockets of clay. We ended up with pockets of bad soil and worse soil. And it was all clay, all gray clay. So we knew that we'd have to do that microbiological. We started the program very early. And we decided um, in terms of the initial seed mix to use, uh, like I said, the coastal prairie mix and to use um, uh, some flower mixes from Native American seed. But we also went out and did seed collecting on a number of sites, including U of H, Deer Park Prairie, and other places, so that we could conserve some of that local ecotype. And we could also engage the community. That's very important. When you are working with somebody that doesn't know anything about prairies, and you're saying, we're just going to put this in, and you're going to have it, they have no ownership of that project. So if you can get them to say, all right, we're going to go collect with you in the field. We're going to spend time with you in the field. We're going to show you what this looks like. We're going to collect these, and we're going to use it back there. That's how you build ownership. So we very much went to, all, we went to like seven sites. And then my friend Tom Solomon, wherever he is, right there, gave us big batches of bags of seed that he had cleaned and were ready to go. And I'll tell you that seed, those plants are doing amazingly. So we, we decided on a, uh, a, a, a scenario where we use this Native American seed mix and went with that. Now this is something that I, I was just not real happy about. And, and I didn't have any control over this, like, like Texas Parks and U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, MD Anderson is a bureaucracy. So once contracts are signed, you can forget about modifying anything in a timely basis. So what they decided was, we're gonna plant, we're gonna sow seeds in August. <laughs> bad, bad. And we're gonna hydra seed it in. So from my standpoint, neither one of those was very good, and their hydro seeding machine was not operating properly that day. So it'd be a clump of stuff here. So if you don't know what hydro seeding is, it's what they use on the side of the highway sometimes to lay down Bermuda seed. They mix the seeds with an aqueous solution and some, some material, they spray it out. Well, we told them that this wasn't gonna work very well because they'd seen this before somewhere for native seeds. Anyway, they did it, and uh, this is what it looks like. Yeah, and they spray it out, and, and the contractor was like, you know, we got this. We do grass all the time. What kind of grass do you do? Bermuda grass. I said, different, different thing altogether. He said, kid, don't, I mean literally, kid, don't worry about it, I got this. So he did this, and what ended up happening is, we ended up with this. So August, this is, this is January, okay? Bad news. Jaime Gonzalez goes to sleep. He's got a project that probably 300,000 people see in a week, okay? Looks like that. Not good, okay? So, adaptive management. Change your strategy if what you're using is not working. Now, there was a lot of good stuff coming up there, but it was mostly Forbes. We had not seen the native grasses coming on very strong at all because there is a wide genetic difference in dormancy of that seed. So we had to make a decision, and we knew that we were working in an urban context, so we couldn't fail, and it had to come up that year and look like something. Otherwise, this whole thing was going to become Bermuda grass again. We'd lose our opportunity. So we made this decision. We called up uh, Jim Willis, and we uh, talked to him about what he'd been using on some of his projects as supplement to wild seed. And what we decided to do was use some of his mix. Now, these are uh, this is from Bamert Seed Company. That's the seed level right there. And what you'll see is you'll see um, releases uh, that are 
less genetically diverse for sure than our wild collect local. But here's what they, th this is where they really work out for urban plantings. I'm not suggesting you do this in the countryside, but um, it is, a, it is a, something to discuss at, at lunch. When you want things to establish, you gotta go th sometimes with things that are a little bit reliable in terms of when they're gonna come up. So we, we use these, these cultivars of the big four and wild collect admixture in addition to the wild collect stuff that we had, the wild harvest stuff that we had used. So where did some of this stuff come from? It came from, okay, it came from Kansas and other places, but what we needed this stuff to do is not stay around forever, but to grow up, hold the ground, see what survived, to allow that native mixture to come through. We needed it to look like something, okay? So we planted it. Now, what we're gonna show you later on is this setup that Jim Willis had. Jim didn't want to drag a gigantic seed drill into the middle of the city, okay? Logistically tough. So instead what he did is he, he brought a harrow to kind of scratch up the soil here, and then he used a cultipacker, and we were spreading the seeds. We're gonna use the same technique later today, out in the field, on a, on a, uh, on a site outside. And we looked at, at how the seed went in and how much of the seed was showing and all that stuff. Did we know absolutely this was gonna work? No, we didn't know this is absolutely gonna work, but it did. And it worked astonishingly well. And so for small projects in the middle of the city, instead of having to have a Jim Willis or somebody that knows how to calibrate and use a gigantic seed drill, which is not very maneuverable, this actually, pulling behind a Polaris tube implement separately, might be a, a little bit of a better thing for tight spaces, for small spaces. And it's, and it's left us, there he goes, cranking the seed. And it's left us talking about whether or not we need to have an urban, um, unit that does nothing but this for all the little urban sites. Okay, so do we need to have an ecological team for prairies for the for the urban sites? One other thing that we did. I'm going to wrap this up in three minutes, but. It was critical to document what biodiversity was there for two reasons. One is, from an ecological standpoint, we, want to, we do want to see how these function ecologically. Because sometimes in the conservation community, people say, oh, you're wasting your time, these little sites, blah, blah, blah. And that has nothing to do with the educational outreach purpose. That has to do with the biological function. They're too small. Well, here's what we found. What we found is that these sites are more biologically rich than I think we know. So we had those folks from U of H Coastal Center come out and survey our grass, grasshoppers, crickets, and katydids. In four years of collecting, four years, solid years, going out several times a week with interns for four years, they identified 30 species at the U of H Coastal Center, this beautiful, huge remnant. They came out um, for two hours, and found 11 species of katydids, crickets, and grasshoppers. Two of which that are flightless. One that needs permanent standing bodies of water. There is no permanent standing body of water there. Subsequent counts have found a county record for a bee that's only been counted down in the Rio Grande Valley. We've had, you know, cottontails born in here and nighthawks hunting it. Last year we had 200 goldfinches using it. So I guess what I'm saying is, un until we know more about these urban systems and how they work, I would really like to hold off on judgment about how valuable from an ecological standpoint they can be. For a migrating bird or butterfly or bees that like to cluster in these areas, I think that they can be pretty valuable. But as much as anything, they can help us tell the story of the prairie, where people are. Okay, right, let me... Let me wrap up here real quick. And the way that we're really measuring success, I have just two slides, the way we're measuring success is two, two ways. What is the acceptance within the medical community of having this here? Well, it may be pretty great and it's surprising. We had a donor come by, it's kind of a funny story, it won't take long. We had a donor drive by this and he called up the fundraising department at, at MD Anderson Cancer Center. He said, I think I wanna to donate to you guys. And they said, well, we were always taking money. And, and they said, for what? And he said, for landscaping. 
It looks like you guys are really low on money and can't afford a lawnmower. <laughs> okay? And, uh, and so it, that was a point at which David, being the guardian, could say, no, this is what we're trying to do and educate that donor. And that's when he actually made that video and they sent it out to all of their donors. So, make the connections. The, the coastal prairie community and the conservation community in general just needs more connections like MD Anderson. So we lead tours there um, this fall and this spring. We, uh, there are a lot of immunocompromised kids in MD Anderson and Texas Children's Nature Center, which is our Texas Children not Nature Center, Texas Children's Hospital, which is directly across the street where my son was born two months ago. So we might do virtual field trips using this site and help the teachers in the building who can't get outside connect with something real. Now, this is the last thing I'm going to show you. Where do we go from here in terms of urban prairie restoration and in grassland restoration? Well, later on we're going to see this thing in real life, in the flesh. And uh, this was built by Chip Davis, who is here in the crowd. And this is the burn box. And uh, I'm not going to show you the whole thing, but but suffice it to say, if we're going to do urban grassland restoration, at some point we might have blocks that we want to burn. And, um, and I know that there's, uh, there's great interest in this in that it might help us create the conditions necessary to get people to bite off on smaller burns in patches. So for the fire bugs in you, it's very exciting, right? So Chip is going to tell you all about this, why it was built, who asked him to, uh, to build it, and who paid him to build it. Uh, I'll, I'll save that secret. But I think we have a real opportunity here. The drought of 2011 created conditions inside cities, not just Houston, but other towns, that killed a lot of trees, and people want to know, what can we plant that might be more drought resistant? We have never, ever had this much interest from corporate campuses to hospitals to other places to put in wild grasslands where people live. It's been amazing. So, let me answer a couple of, this picture I just got this morning, which I was very excited about. The average child today spends seven minutes of unstructured time outside a day. So, my wife, you know, the question on the Facebook, on David's Facebook page is, I wonder what this kid was asking himself as he was walking through here. I bet you I know, because I was that little kid one time. What's around the corner? What adventure am I going to find? So, if I can answer any questions quickly, I will then get up Aaron Shyamalan, but I will answer any questions you got at the... Yes, sir. Um, after the guy did the arrow and the broadcast cedar, did he follow it up with anything else? A cult of Packer. Yeah. And I think it was that combination of things that, that really worked. Like I said, we actually have that set up here today, and we're going to show the use of it. And uh, we have some native seeds here, and we're going to be restoring a little 90 by 90 acre chunk of Seaborn Creek Park later today. So we want to show you that in action. We'll show you the, the burn box as well as Mark Morgan Stern is going to show you something about growing springing plants. So very excited about that. Anybody else have any other questions? Yes, sir. Tommy, are, are you guys doing any uh, work with any opportunities out of uh, Memorial Park? So we are on the Ecotech panel for Memorial Park. So uh, just real quickly, uh, won't spend too much time. We made a strategic decision at KPC. Uh, if you've ever been to the Katy Prairie, you're probably still driving. Okay. Uh, it takes a long time to get out to us, about an hour from downtown Houston. So we decided a long time ago, maybe four or five years ago, that if we were going to get people to visit us on this Katy Prairie thing, if people didn't know what a prairie was, they're not going to get in their car and drive an hour. Just not going to work. And so what we decided was that we needed to be a physical presence, not just coming and doing talks and everything, but physically present in the middle of the city so that we could help uh, bring that. So what we do is we bring uh, different levels of technical assistance to different partners. So in Herman Park, it was bringing back, helping to work with the Houston Zoo and others to grow up plants to bring prairie back to Herman Park for the first time in like 80 years. In Memorial Park, it's helping them think through what it would take to reestablish 
grassland and what sorts of grasslands they can establish, but also what are the interpretive um, and the storytelling, the narrative part. And that narrative part is, I cannot tell you, it's, it's a difference between success and failure. If you don't get the story right, for all of our complications, we are still descended from people who lived in caves and told each other stories. That is still the most effective way of communicating. Not the internet, not any of that stuff. If people believe your story, they will do whatever it takes to get what you need done. And that's what I know. So we're working with them in two different ways, both from the cultural aspect of interpreting it, but also, in, in, and now we're working on trying to find some seeds that will work for them. Because what we need more of are early successional grasses. We're working with the Nature Conservancy, U.S. Fish and Wildlife, and others to find candidates that we can put into these native mixes that will come up, grow well, establish, hold back the invasives, and work in an urban setting where maybe people want a lower prairie than something super tall. And we've also worked, uh, we've been working hand in hand with the folks at Buffalo Bayou Park. And we've been partners with them as they're trying to establish 11 acres on Buffalo Bayou near downtown. Yep. Any other questions?